Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you for joining Dr. Marlene Tromp, president of Boise State University for this national digital summit. As we come together to rethink our students launch pad, I so appreciated hearing from presidents across the nation, their perspectives and insights into campus strategies. And now we focus a little bit more deeply on student engagement and well being. Because we're limited in our time today, I've prepared uh, a few questions for our panelists. There are over 300 of you in this concurrent session. Now you're welcome to submit your questions and comments, but what I'd like to do is get a little creative. I'll try to work through them if possible, but what we've decided to do is to create a post-event interactive blog of sorts or a series of articles in order to weave your questions and your comments into a continued national dialogue. This webinar is being recorded today to be shared later on the Boise State Project Launchpad website. And I wanna begin by just sharing a little bit of context. We're living through a global health pandemic. Many in our community are experiencing racial violence, strife, economic challenge, and we're in the midst of recovery and a political divide. And all of these things are playing out on our college campuses, which I should add, are under a national microscope. Questions of relevance, purpose, value. And I know we're certainly embattled with a misunderstanding and misperception of our core focus to help our students develop the knowledge and skills and turn those into a compelling story for an employer, for a graduate school committee, for the Peace Corps. So today we're here to discuss student engagement and well being and what we're doing to ensure students have the support they need throughout their collegiate experience in order to truly launch. We want them to be able to successfully navigate what's next. So let's start by meeting our panelists. I'm going to invite each of them to introduce themselves from where they hail and perhaps to set the stage for our session with a little bit of context. The top one or two things that frame how you're moving through today's environment. Pablo, might I invite you to begin? Thank you, Leslie. Uh, hello again, my name is Pablo Regarin. I serve as the Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs at the University of California, Davis. Pronouns are he, him, and his. As I was thinking about our session today, there are two key uh, contextual foundations um, that I wanted to share. The first is that there is no single solution, no single strategy, uh, to address the, the various needs um, that confront us around student engagement and uh, in the times that we're in. And so it's important that we move beyond our traditional toolbox. We often rely on past practice and we really need to rethink our work and evaluate how nimble we can be, how responsive we can be as a campus. What does it mean for a campus to be uh, student ready and responsive in these times? Um, and so that's going to cause being out of your comfort zone, trying new things. So that's one, one piece that I think is an important foundation. And so I'm continually evaluating how responsive are we being to the issue this week, you know, tomorrow, yesterday, et cetera. The second area that I think is really critical, it's important that we take an equity-minded leadership approach in all of our work, particularly responding to the pandemic. We know that there are uh, disparate impacts across, across communities of color, socioeconomic status. And so we need to continually disaggregate our student outcomes, student engagement, outreach, who's participating. We need to disaggregate by race, by socioeconomic status, by first generation status. Um, who is showing up? Who are we reaching? Who are we not? And how are we being consequential in addressing the disparate impacts? If we are not measuring that or evaluating um, our outreach strategies, um, we could possibly um, in, um, deepen some of those inequities. And so it's gonna be vitally important that we all 
across the board engage in an equity minded approach um, in this work. Thank you. Thank you. Lori, would you be willing to go next? Sure, thank you so much. I'm Lori McDonald. I'm Vice President for Student Affairs at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City, Utah. And I use she, her, hers pronouns. And um, I so appreciate that, Pablo. I was <laughs> nodding. That was one of the first things that came to mind. Um, and, and I love that, that Leslie framed this as what is the context, not necessarily strategies, but context. And I was thinking this, this ability to be flexible and move along with changing information. You mentioned weekly, Pablo, and I would almost say daily. <laughs> we are faced with, oh, that's new, hadn't thought of that, um, which makes the work interesting for sure, um, but very, very challenging. And another um, context for me personally that I was reflecting on is that I am a, um, new to my role. I became vice president in July of 2019. And I had started my first year and was feeling like the visionary uh, strategy that was happening with a new leadership team. And we were going to talk about innovative service delivery and all of these different things came to a screeching halt. And I thought in March, you know, not to be flippant about it, but student affairs is used to crisis and responding and centering student needs. And I thought we can do this, we, we can do this. And of course, I think all of us thought it would be a few months at the most. And so nine months later, I have reflected that I was feeling a little down that I, I wasn't being as, a, as visionary of a leader as I had wanted to be. And I felt like I'm being so responsive instead. But in further reflection, I think it has helped me listen more and in the reaction it's still reflecting so so very regularly and deliberately on what we're doing and as Pablo mentioned disaggregating who are we reaching who are we not reaching in very different ways than we've ever done before and so I'm trying to appreciate the visioning that can happen during a crisis and um, thinking of, of the context of my leadership just a little bit differently than when I started. Thank you. Thank you. Sharon, might I ask you to go next? Thank you, Leslie. Good morning. Um, and so Sharon Smith, Associate Vice President, Dean of Students, Arizona State University. Um, and so over the last nine months, um, I think everyone can um, you know, relate in how much uh, our world has changed um, as we've navigated a, a, new, a new world. Um, and so as Leslie had um, posed this question and thinking about how our work has changed, um, one of the things that has continued to resonate with me and it's two guiding principles that we are currently using here at Arizona State University and in, in our work with students, uh, specific, specifically student affairs. And it's been, how do we affirm each student um, and how are we working with them as an individual? And more now than ever, our work is, has become more individualized. Um, our students have really um, pressed us to even be more adaptable. Um, so we've already, we were already adaptive, adapting on a regular basis. And now um, we've had to do that a bit more with laser focus, but doing that a lot quicker. Um, and so going back to this idea of affirming every single student, that is possible. Um, it is very much possible. And at times, um, whether you're at a larger institution or a smaller institution, you're saying, well, how can we do that? Um, and it, it's been important in terms of how we've been working, uh, myself, my team, with all of our partners to be able to connect with each student because each student is coming from a different place. The um, pandemic is impacting each student differently, whether it's across their socioeconomic status, it doesn't matter where a student is coming from, it's impacting them differently. And, and therefore, um, contextually, um, it's been, how are, how are we working with each student um, uh, to really understand what are their true needs because no student is the same and right now, uh, one size fits all isn't working. Um, uh, and so 
with navigating um, one, this idea of being um, adaptable, um, doing so quickly, um, yet still having laser focus, but also from a place of um, connecting with each student um, at varying levels. Sometimes our students are saying, I just need you to listen today. Um, because we tend to be problem solver. I am the biggest problem solver there is. I'm like, we will fix it. Um, and right now they're, they're just needing us to listen. Um, and so it's, I have been approaching my work very much from a place and also been encouraging my team of, uh, to do the important job of how do we listen? How do we listen intentionally? How do we also um, be present, adapt, and recognize that each student needs something different? Thank you so much, Sharon. Robin, please. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Robin Holmes Sullivan, and I serve as the Vice President and Dean of Students at Lewis and Clark College in Portland, Oregon. And I'm just, just very grateful and thrilled to be here and to participate in this panel, because I know that it, it's so important for us to all experience a sense of universality, you know, that we're all going through a similar thing together. And we need to talk about that and talk about those issues. So I really, really resonate, resonate with everything that my colleagues have already said about adaptability and flexibility, about meeting students where they are and serving them individually and collectively, about making sure that we maintain the lens of equity and inclusion, all really important. I would also add to that context and the thing that I try to remember and work from as much as I possibly can. Uh, and I notice that when I move away from that particular context, um, I don't do as well uh, and I don't lead uh, as well. And that is the context that come from hope, optimism and preparedness. Uh, that holding hope and holding optimism is something that I think one as student affairs professionals, we understand and I think are gravitate toward. Um, but I'm finding out now more than ever how much and how needed that is from our students, from our staff and our faculty to be able to experience that and to see that, to help them get on to the next thing or be ready for the next thing. And I think everything we're gonna talk about today is undergirded by our ability collectively to continue to hold that hope and optimism to prepare us for that future. Thank you. Thank you so much. And my name is Leslie Webb and I'm the Vice President for Student Affairs and Enrollment Management at Boise State University. The only thing I'd add to my incredible colleagues is for me personally, it's been helpful to remember that keeping my eye forward focused and trained toward the future student success, every, like, like Lori said, every day throws a different challenge or a wrench in something that we thought uh, we knew or we understood. And that hasn't been the case. And so for me, both sharp short term and long term planning has been necessary and it's allowed me to keep hope um, and and our in a future forward facing thinking at, at the center of my work. Thank you, colleagues. Um, I really appreciate the context that will frame our conversation today. Um, you know, I think it's important to name that that we are often uh, the folks who, who sit at the cabinet level who are truly in tune to the students. We're meeting with students, we're advising student governments, we're interacting with students on a regular basin, basis, as, as Sharon mentioned. And um, one of the things that, that we know well is what our students are facing and how they're experiencing the reality of today and what their lived experiences are. And I'm wondering if I can just start with a question um, that is this, what are, uh, in, in, from your, through your lens, what are the top two stressors students are facing on your campus? Well, I'm happy to start, Leslie. Um, there are there are many, but I bet we will uh, find a lot in common as we talk about this, whether we are currently at small schools, medium schools, or larger schools, because students are, are the same across all of those venues. And I thought about two particular uh, stressors that I see over and over again uh, with our students. One is, um, as we all know, one of the developmental tasks that our students go through is, is they come to college, is adjusting to college. That's normal, that's what they do, that's part of their growth that uh, we're happy that they're able to participate in um, by being so blessed to, to come to college. 
But that adjustment to college has been very disrupted uh, through this current nine month uh, period, especially when we think about one of the major tasks that students are navigating is their ability to make so social connections or engagement as we're talking about today. That's been compromised due to social distancing expectations. Um, many uh, colleges are on online instruction primarily um, and all the COVID restrictions that we know that are in place. And so it's made that social connecting aspect that students should be navigating through uh, very, very compromised and, and difficult. There was a, a study done by the Association of University Counseling Center Directors, AUCCD, uh, earlier this year. It showed that isolation and loneliness now has become the number one presenting issue that students who are seeking professional services are presenting with, even above anxiety. Uh, and so that isolation and loneliness is something that we should be addressing and thinking about uh, as we work with our students. And then the second stressor or issue that I would comment on would be um, the ability of our students to demonstrate not only resilience, what we've been talking about for the last five years and the change in that demonstration by our students, but now they're having to show what I would call multiple bounce back, back resilience, right? Because they have multiple stressors that are and uncertainties that are happening simultaneously in a prolonged periods of time. Just one quick example, for us this summer in, uh, in Portland, uh, Oregon, as many of you know, there were horrendous wildfires. So we had the COVID and all the COVID adjustments and students having to leave campus or um, deal with leaving campus. And then we had wildfires that led to major smoke events uh, that was almost intolerable for any of us to, to deal with. We still had the social unrest that was going on in this country. And we still have high, high achieving students who have a pressure to succeed. They wanted us to cancel classes. They wanted us to give them pass, no pass. They just, they can't do this at the same time with all these things going on. And then on top of that, an uncertain future that they know that they're facing. And so that kind of need for multiple bounce back resiliency is something that we're really gonna need to turn our attention to and helping our students to develop the skills and competencies they're gonna need in order to achieve that. Robin, every time I hear you speak, I learn <laughs> such wonderful ways to make sense <laughs> of my world. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. um, I would definitely agree with that. Along um, with that, I had been looking at some of our survey data where we've been asking them, you know, what are some of your stressors? And you know, we put together the lists, including financial pressures and childcare, and even concerns about health and the pandemic and how to, to navigate all of that. But one that kind of surprised me, but shouldn't have, is that so many expressed a great deal of stress in adjusting to new academic platforms, obligations, tools, you know, our students who do really well were having to just adjust their learning styles. Um, our faculty certainly were doing that along with them. And we saw that both coming out of our surveys in the spring and continuing into the fall. Although most said they were a little more used to it and it wasn't quite as um, surprising. Things like time management, motivation, uh, just keeping up with their studies and assignments was something that was on their mind most readily. And um, I, I think I should have, have understood that. And then the second one that um, I, th I think Robin spoke to very well too is just uncertainty. Has, uh, it has always been a part of the human life and, and the need for, for some resiliency and some coping, but uncertainty, whether it's with the health of a loved one or the job market or you know, what next month is going to look like in our community that has different restrictions being lifted and putting in place and just in general ultimate uncertainty was causing a great deal of stress. And so for for the I agree with both Robin and Lori because we've we've seen the same thing. And, and Robin, I think you said it well, where all of our students are dealing with um, similar issues. One of the things that we've also seen and students have talked about is how do we make those deeper connections? 
because they're wanting no social interactions, um, especially our traditional age students, but really all of our students have wanted that social interactions. And so that's, I know one of the stressors that they've talked about, which I think has also very much contributed to some of the self-isolation that they're feeling. Um, but what I've also found is they've figured out how to sort of build these smaller communities. Um, I'll use the word a pod. Um, I know there are different words that um, are being used, but in the midst of them um, experiencing um, some of the social um, isolation, um, they've figured out who, who is, who's my group, who's my pod, um, who am I going to see on a regular basis, whether it's been their suite mate um, or other individuals on their floors. And so that's been, you know, sort of that, in some ways unexpected, but expected um, with our students. The other stressor that um, we've seen has been technology. And Lori mentioned it, technology. Um, and while we pivoted quickly um, as a university, um, it doesn't mean that all of our students who are in different parts of even our, our county, state, or even across the US um, had um, equity when it came to just accessing um, technology, specifically Wi-Fi. And so we did a tremendous job and we sent out um, laptops and we mailed um, you know, hotspots. We did so many things, but it also proved that there are uh, parts of our communities that still were not technologi technologically equipped to be able to handle what it meant for thousands of individuals to shift to an online environment. And so that again is something we heard in the spring. Um, it's gotten better. I, I think a lot of companies have adjusted, um, but that's something um, that was very apparent to us. And then the also, in addition to that, along the lines of technology, um, what it meant for our students, especially some of our first gen students, this is the first time they're um, coming to university they then um, just struggle with the demands of home. And so we didn't factor in what it meant to have younger siblings at home um, whose parents um, were working. And so them trying to figure out the technology piece, balancing social isolation, and then being at home and managing the demands of home. Um, again, we, we've learned so much from that. Thank you, Sharon. I want to address a question that one of our um, colleagues from up north at the University of Idaho has asked, and it's, it's really uh, where we were going next. Um, our students are really struggling um, to, to find places where they feel like they matter, uh, where they feel like they belong, where they're trying to find where their pods are, to use your language, Sharon, their communities, whether in the classroom, in the hybrid experiences we're offering in, 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 in virtual clubs and organizations. And so my question for you is what are some strategies that you've employed during this remote, hybrid, socially distanced time? I would, I'd be happy to, to start. Um, one of the things in, in uh, trying to um, leverage what students can offer, particularly those that were near our campus, uh, living on campus or close to campus, um, was to, and, and this is a partnership with our um, department, our health, public health department, which was the creation of a, a position. We knew students needed jobs as well. So it was a combination of a mini job stimulus as well as the need to um, help steward our community around um, public health education. So we, cre we created this position called the Aggie Public Health Ambassador and about 250 students were hired. We must have gotten close to 500 applications in total. So we knew there was demand for paid positions. These are um, uh, paid positions and essentially they got uh, training from our public health uh, department um, as community educators. They were scheduled around campus. Now they're beginning to go um, off campus as well um, to doing things from reminding folks to wear masks to um, uh, community education to handing out um, um, incentives to um, acknowledging that people were soon for making an effort. Um, so very much a, from a, a positive um, aspect. And uh, we've seen tremendous success with it. And I think it, there's been multiple successes. Of course, the, 
The public health aspects have been beneficial. The fact that they were paid student positions and some of them who have an interest in public health as a career uh, development area. Now, this, this idea came together as a concept. There was a lot of, well, I don't know if we can do this, uh, uh, questions up in the air and a team that came together and I mean, just to hire 250 students in a matter of three weeks is a daunting task to go through any of our, our payroll sign up systems. But just all of it together and how quickly it came together, I, I was, we were really proud of both that we could again address the multiple issues as well as the sense of purpose and sense of um, connection. And so that's one, one approach um, that we took. And I'll just mention one other area because uh, Robin and others highlighted this adjustment. Um, and, and I think one of the things that we've seen is there's a sense of loss. And what that sense of loss can be from, I don't get to have my first year or my junior year, whatever, wherever I'm at, the way I was anticipating, it also can be a sense of loss from like, I don't feel like I'm getting the value of what I'd be getting in a remote situation. So there's a lot of feelings of loss. And so, although we couldn't offer a traditional in, you know, in-person instruction experience, the question became, how do we support our students in addressing the changes and the loss that they're experiencing? Another quick, and again, none of these are magic solutions or that everybody should do. This is what worked for us. But I think it was a it was a demonstration of our nimbleness to respond. One was in the change in housing. So we had a lot we had a lot of control over on campus students in our residence halls and apartments on campus. But then we had many more students living off campus in private leases, in which um, there wasn't the flexibility. And so we on the fly in about a, about a week and a half created an off campus private lease help desk through our basic needs team. Not something that created that existed before, and it was a both by phone as well as via Zoom. But we found that students need support in in making the adjustments, both the sense of loss as well as very tactical things like housing um, uh, adjustments. And those are two examples that I think really tested or were a demonstration of our nimbleness to respond, which is okay. We know there's a sense of loss. What are we doing to help students adjust? Um, address the feelings as well as the the the, the stressors that are um, the deepening the, the, that sense of feeling. And do they feel alone, or do they feel that their institutions are along with them? Just building on that, Pavel, because we did a similar thing with the public health uh, ambassadors, and that the concept behind that that I think you were alluding to of students helping other students. It can't be uh, overstated by any stretch of the imagination because, you know, as we all have just been talking about, there is this sense of, of a loss of control and disappointment, um, uncertainty, things just kind of being out of your hands. And one of the best antidotes to that feeling is to do something, right? And so I know that our students, and I, I think this is true for students across the country, respond to the opportunity to be able to help others. Um, it's something I love about being around college students is because they're so idealistic and they're so willing um, to do that, whether it's staffing a food pantry or helping out students in needs uh, in other ways. I've just been just so impressed with how our students at Lewis and Clark have been coming up with ways to help other students. And it does. It, it helps them. Um, I also just wanted to put in the, the mix of, of strategies or things to do. Again, it highlights something Pablo said in his opening statement is that we're gonna need to do things differently um, and we're gonna need to be nimble ourselves. And sometimes some of the solutions are, are so easy and they don't cost anything. Uh, and it's just a matter of thinking outside of that box, right? And so our issue was that we were seeing that our students were having difficulty with engagement. Um, we had all these restrictions around pods and how many and who could be in it and how, you know all this kind of stuff that they were trying to adjust to. And our residence halls were primarily just very traditional residence halls. And so the occupancy limits on those spaces was not allowing for them to have really sustained contact with more than just four to six people uh, at a time. And so we were thinking about how can we have spaces that are safe that students could observe social distancing and actually interact we're like, oh my gosh, the classrooms. So all of our classrooms, because we're, we're doing in-person instruction, are all set up in such a way that it hits all of the regulations. So on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays, 
I opened up the classrooms late into the evening and instructed the students, use the classrooms in the same way you normally use them in terms of safety, but do your social activities there, whether it's hooking up and watching a movie with, with your pod mates, whatever, so they could stretch out and they could have more room. And they had a sense that I'm safe here because I'm safe when I take classes in the afternoon, I'll be safe to do this in the evening time. So you, using things that are already available to us that are free uh, and innovative and thinking outside that box have been things that we've been trying to, to think about and put into action as much as we can. And isn't it interesting how many of these things I think we will maintain far into the future, even when we can return to quote unquote more regular circumstances. Um, it's really forced us into that. I would concur and uh, um, I love that what's low cost and quick <laughs> that we can um, implement. Um, along those lines, we certainly, I think we've known for a long time that peer-to-peer -peer messaging is incredibly powerful. And it has been that much more important with public health messaging because we know that shaming and blaming does not work um, to get all different types of humans to um, comply with things that are, are challenging and um, and I, I love that framing of a sense of loss. Um, with that, we're putting in all these restrictions on top of that. And I think um, our peer health educators really came, became front and center and expanding those offerings and really um, asking our student leaders, you know, what do they want to hear from one another? How did they, why are they engaging in these public health strategies and can, what, are they willing to share it with others? And really focusing on student to student messaging has been incredibly helpful. And I think we, we need to, to continue to do that. Um, and starting a, um, our equity, diversity, and inclusion um, partners started a, a social media campaign, um, hashtag check on your you crew. And it was really intended to remind us all that just those phone calls, those individual emails, those, hey, how are you doing um, with individuals, whether it's with fellow staff or students who you haven't heard from for, for a while, how important those are to, to engage. And so we're, uh, we're continuing to check on your U crew throughout the year. And um, I think we'll, we'll continue in perpetuity as uh, one of our values. So let's see if I can add. I, I think one of the things uh, we also employed um, students to support, we were calling our students our care crew. But what we also did is we mobilized our staff. Um, and during periods of times, really, our student just wanted to hear from quote unquote an adult. Um, and those phone calls, the emails, um, I made calls, our team made calls. And those are one of the things that have actually been really helpful because students said, look, I just appreciate you calling me. Um, and uh, what we've seen is higher level of engagement um, uh, because they just needed that um, level of adult, again, quote unquote adult um, engagement uh, to just let them know like, hey, we are thinking about you. We had more students answering the phone um, in this season than we've, we've seen and responding to our emails. And in the past, they would say it's too many emails. Um, and right now we've been, we've seen an increase. And so our engager team has done a tremendous job and um, it's every day, seven days a week, even on the weekends, um, we're connecting with students, um, both whether it's an email, um, it's through Zoom, um, it's a phone call, there are follow-up conversations even a week after, a month after. So, and that's proven to be really helpful in addition to all of the peer work that's been happening. Thank you. We have a question from one of our participants and it's so, it's quite thoughtful, but I, I wanna share a little bit of context for you. Earlier in the president's panel, um, uh, uh, presidents uh, you know, that th participated were really sort of talking about the purpose of university and how we really could uh, be um, a bridge, bringing folks together, whether it's political ideologies. I know you all spend much of your time in the space in between. 
I'm certain you do. I don't even have to ask the question. Whether it's between faculty and students, administration and students, students and students, I know you're spending a lot of your time there. And so the question that's been raised really is around this notion of the university being a microcosm, a very polarized uh, nation. And um, we have a, a politicization and a, and a polarization resulting in um, many feeling to some degree othered in a particular, in, in, in multiple uh, contexts. My question for you, um, and at Boise State, I should name that um, some of my colleagues are working on empathy and campaign, promoting listening to understand versus listening to respond. I got it ready to tell you. So um, I, I, I bring this to you and I say, what are your institutions doing to address the fear? Um, and we're seeing that uh, manifesting itself in, in anger and other emotions, but this is the question. What are your institutions um, doing to address the fear that's really at, at the core of some of our student interactions and, and, and at, at the core of our inability to sort of develop community in this, in this challenging time? you on the spot. Well, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Um, so in terms of some of the fears that have been expressed um, in our engagement with students um, and different constituents on campus has been around um, uh, what we might call academic flexibility or some accommodations um, uh, in their learning. And so for students, um, whether it was uh, the need to, with the additional responsibilities, I think Sharon brought this up regarding, um, you know, taking care of siblings and, and being in a different situation if you're learning from home and there's different responsibilities, um, uh, allowing for um, asynchronous opportunities to learn to catch up, not always having to be uh, in a, let's say a live um, Zoom session. And so I know that the issue around um, how we're serving our students, fear that where they're, where the context that they're in won't align well with what the classroom and academic expectations are. I think our faculty have been very flexible and there've been um, numerous, um, um, each quarter there's been a list of um, a kind of academic flexibility um, from our academic senate out to the faculty. So that's been one fear is how I'm set up, um, is it gonna align to what the, academic expectations are. And also I would say a fear of comparing each other. Like if I come to campus or if I stay home remotely, what are, what are other people doing? Am I doing the right thing? And so we've had to do a lot of work in terms of listening and almost reflecting back to students. Okay, what are your needs? What is your situation? What presents the most safe option for you? Maybe for some students that will be to come and live on campus. Is that an option? Um, do they understand the trade-offs? And so having to explain some of those trade-offs, a lot of times students will, will they can analyze their specific context, but some coaching can help in that process. I think that's one. The other one has been that we've heard from faculty is that how do they respond to students who were in crises, um, whether they're mental health stressors. And so we have engaged our, um, our, our counseling team in um, providing strategies to our faculty. And we've had a really big response from faculty wanting to increase their toolbox. Also hear that, yes, it's okay to relax certain things or to, to um, have some, I think what can commonly be referred to as mental health first aid uh, type of training. And so it's like supporting our faculty um, so that they're in a, a good place to respond because they too were struggling with this in the classroom. So. Th that's one way where we, so I'd say there was a fear from faculty, also a fear from students around the alignment of expectations. Um, I've been, those have been a couple of strategies, both guiding students as well as providing support to our faculty to support students. And I would add, I, while Pablo talked about um, faculty, I think staff has also been concerned. Um, especially as they've been high engagers um, with our students, those who are on campus. Um, and it's, it's been really supporting them of what, it, what this change means. 
um, and helping them to navigate, um, you know, where they've been more traditional student affairs individuals, where they plan programs, we say engage, 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 and they had to quickly shift to this virtual engagement. They're like, well, no one's coming. Um, and it was, and at one point we moved to um, actual in-person engagement, of course, doing that um, physically distanced, um, finding outdoor spaces. And so part of this was how to help them also be part of the solution of what will make most sense um, in uh, how we do a level of hybrid engagement what makes sense virtually, what makes sense also in person, but also how do we partner with students? Um, and uh, that uncertainty um, started to diminish because they also, as they were playing a role in this role in, in sort of creating these experiences um, for students and with students, they recognized what do students need? And again, I go back to that level of social interaction that our students craved. Um, and we saw benefits from that. Um, but it took our faculty, um, you know, uh, I'm sorry, our staff, um, some time to sort of adjust to the uncertainty of, okay, well, if we plan it, uh, might it shift? Um, it, because as things have shifted, um, both locally and nationally, we've had to shift. Um, and uh, they were able to say, okay, we will give it a shot and it's gone well. And again, we have seen um, engagement increase, especially with our on-campus students where um, having both virtual events and masked um, physically distanced events uh, making a difference. The other fear that we saw really early was just families. Um, all families were struggling. What does it mean? Um, and I had lots of conversations with families about what does it mean to have my student actually come to campus and live? Um, and talking through what made most sense, not only for the student, but also what made most sense for the family. Um, and those were tough conversations because families were really navigating some really tough decisions about do I let my, my student um, head out of state when we're in, this, in the midst of this um, pandemic um, and families decided um, and we were able to meet those families who said we want our, our student to be on campus um, and so that meant a lot of engagement with them um, and uh, some of it went really really well students continued to thrive um, and then there were some families who said we think this is the decision of to allow our students to um, stay in our synchronous environment. Um, and so, so, so those were really the, the two fears. Now there are lots of other fears, but the two that I think um, were most pronounced um, as we started this process. Thank you. I'm gonna move us into uh, sort of into a, in, into a new topic area as we get ready to close out this session. But before I do, I wanted to remind um, uh, both our, our panelists and our participants that the Launchpad website includes a clearinghouse where we will put documents that might be might be helpful. Robin named a, a study and, 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 a, and a survey that was done, and we'll put that in the clearinghouse after this event so that you can access these resources. And my, my question for you all um, would be, would you consider doing that as well? You have access to documents and resources and reports and innovative things you've done on your campuses, and we'd like to learn from you as well. So please do utilize that clearinghouse. And perhaps Jacob will, Jacob will put that into the chat for us so you can see where where that links to. But I'd like to, to change uh, focus for a moment. And I want to talk a little bit about career education and career development. You know, how we prepare students for life beyond um, really begins before they even arrive on our doorsteps. And so at Boise State, our efforts have focused on embedding career education into the curriculum and into the co-curriculum. Um, we've been growing experiential education so that students can really build their own um, and stay connected to the institution, especially during a time like this. So for example, uh, this past summer, a career services team launched the Hometown Challenge. And students, students were invited to design and create impact projects in their home communities. And then what we did was we invited those students into a classroom setting to unpack those experiences. Now, all the while, and this gets to something Pablo said earlier, all the while receiving funding 
to do such a project because we've realized that one of the only ways to increase access to our students with limited resources is to fund experiential education. So panelists, my, my question for you is, what are you doing on your campuses to fortify a student's launch pad throughout their college experience? In other words, how are you centering career education? I can share one of the um, projects that we have going on. So there's there's um, two, we, we just um, uh, developed something called Aggie Launch, which is really a shift in culture and how we look at career preparation at a research institution and, and rethink it. And there's experiential learning um, opportunities and uh, career development activities and we're trying to embed them in the curriculum and in the co-curricular co experience. As Leslie mentioned, one of the, one of the um, activities that I was really impressed with, and I've only, I've, I've only been at Davis since July, um, but well, there's a program called EVO in our um, athletics program. And it essentially takes our student athletes, uh, someone as, as a captive audience in this EVO program, which is, stands for evolution, and it integrates career development activities. So if you're a student athlete, you, you do a series of activities at certain milestones, just as you would train for your, when you're in season or when, for your sport. Um, and so I think the embedding of the career development activities as something everybody does really was, I think a phenomenal way to, to, to embed it into a co-curricular um, experience. And so we're looking to figure out, okay, if we take our tutors or, you know, from our, our learning center or our um, RAs in the, in the housing context, how can we take where we have larger groups of students that are either employed or connected through some shared activity and then integrate um, uh, career development activities. So we're just at the stage where we have acknowledged we need to have a shift in our culture on the campus. And that's where Aggie Launch came up. But I think this uh, process where, that where it's embedded into something that everybody does as part of a shared experience is really um, where we're headed. So we're trying to replicate, I'm interested in replicating um, our um, Aggie Evo program um, because it, it, is, it can be um, uh, put into really any shared experience. And there are also dividends to uh, career development activities for our RAs, for our, and we have, we have some, some, I would say, more informal um, professional development going on. And so trying to make it more systematic um, across different groups. So it does mean we have to have more paid time. Um, so let's say if it's for, for our tutors, not just for tutoring, but for preparing and for engagement in um, uh, workshops, et cetera, um, mentoring. So that's trying to figure out how to embed that in the right place um, and seen as something that everybody does and not as an extra is where, where we're at. Yeah, it's so interesting, Pablo. I, I, I was listening to you and, and thinking about the fact that there are some groups uh, because of their affinity or whatever else that uh, are intact. And those particular groups, we oftentimes have very structured, consistent, expected experiences for them to have. You know, same thing on my campus with our student athletes, by far the ones who participate probably the most in kind of career development types of things on a very, very consistent basis because it's just part of the athlete experience and they have to do it because the coach or someone else said they had to do it, right? Um, a similar thing happens across some of our affinity groups, whether it's the Black Student Union or other uh, affinity groups. But it's, it's interesting that we don't kind of take that same approach with, with everybody, right? And um, kind of really regularize those experiences. It's like, well, if you want to, we hope you'll do this or that with career development. I think it's something for us to, to really think about and revisit uh, about what the college experience really should be and that every student should have an, an opportunity to do. Um, because I, I think that happens less than we would like it to across all of our student groups. Yeah, if I could just add one, one other thing that Robin, um, um, you know, um, reminded me of part of this came up from uh, professionalizing tutors and looking at how to invest in professional development uh, in tutoring. 
But I would say overall, we should not overlook student employment, whether it's the dining hall, whether it's at the library. We have captive audiences and we have supervisors who often from just their goodwill and interest will develop folks. And so I've, I've thought, okay, as we look at career development, it, it may be that you will not be in the food industry or you will not be um, you know, in the residential life area, but there's so many skills and it, those, many of those positions serve as launch, launching pads. How do we make them more intentional, more systematic? And, uh, um, and so I would really say both creating more student employment on campus um, as well as off campus, and then trying to, you know, when we, when we calculate budgets, like are we giving people room to do the career development activities beyond just the kind of survival mode of getting everything covered? And so how do we embed that in, and can we make strategic investments in those areas? And the, the, the last thing I'll say, we're on a fundraising campaign specifically to address uh, convert unpaid internships into paid opportunities for the reasons we talked about before in terms of uh, an, an equity approach. And so again, I think having multiple entry points into this is important, but uh, figuring out how to embed it across and, and again, keeping student employment um, in mind as, as a, a good place to embed these things. Oh, I so love that idea, Pablo. I want to celebrate you for bringing it up. What an incredible opportunity to have a framework. If all student employee supervisors had that and they were working from that, building in reflection components. Anyway, powerful. Thank you. So folks, it would not be a session with a group of student affairs and enrollment management professionals if there wasn't a call to action. So to conclude our time together today, I would like to ask you, what one challenge do you have for the folks who've joined us today, whether presidents or vice presidents or other campus leaders? What can be done in these environments to improve the lived experiences of our students? Leave them with one call to action. Who'd like to go first? I'll go first, Leslie. Um, and so this is like three. Um, it, <laughs> I just couldn't do one, right? Um, but really in, in this current period, and Leslie, you talked about the future, um, because one of the things we do is while, while we're dealing with, we're always thinking about how do we move forward? So we're at a hope that Robin talked about. And my call to action is how are we as educators going to be adaptable, engaged and focused um, as we connect with our students, as we connect with our um, various college and university communities, but also the external community. How are we also going to connect with those individuals where we are living in a very polarized world, which means the work that we do um, as institutions of higher education has to go beyond just our campuses, but also in our, in our community. So that is my, my call to action is um, being adaptable, um, engaged, focused, not only for our environments, but also beyond. Mine was similar in that um, that was what came to mind was how do we charge ourselves to remain flexible, um, to remain innovative? I think we're always talking about innovations. That's what universities do, building new knowledge, but we tend to do it rather slowly when it comes to our own organizations, structures, departments, and we, whether it's a fear of doing it too quickly and doing it wrong or lots of the um, analysis paralysis that sometimes we can get into, um, this has really forced us to take risks and be innovative and flexible. And my charge for myself, my staff, and my colleagues is how do we maintain that and, and move forward? And I like that um, Sharon so much adaptable, engaged, and focused. That's how we're going to do it. So thank you. And I would build on that just to say um, the things that I said in the in the opening, uh, I would challenge each and every one of you to truly hold a sense of optimism and hope that we will have a bright future. Students are watching us. They are watching how we feel, how we look, what we say, what our countenance is. And I think holding that sense of hope and optimism is something that's not only good for our students, but it's actually good for all of us. And the last thing I would say uh, in terms of call to action is to really think about ways in which you can demonstrate deep gratitude. 
because it's something that our country really needs right now. And as individuals, I don't care who you are or where you sit on the organizational chart, everyone responds well to feeling and experiencing gratitude. Yeah, I'll just add very briefly, um, I would add, I, I love being driven by hope. I would, as uh, Robin and Lori had mentioned as well. Um, but I would, and I would also just add to it, to be courageous. This is be, you know, we often um, are, are concerned or about not getting things perfect just to be courageous in acting, be more concerned about not acting at all or not doing enough and move forward with that sense of hope and um, a good dose of courage as well. Well, thank you. Um, the only thing I would add is a little bit more in a pra pragmatic space. And that is this, we have to remember, it's so important for us to continue to block and tackle, or you don't get to th throw that special something that gets you a touchdown at the end. I know y'all are missing fo football as much as we, we all are. So I'm going to share that one with you because I do think it's important. The fundamentals of our work matter so deeply. So um, colleagues, on behalf of Boise State University and my president, Dr. Marlene Trump, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much. And I've, I've deeply appreciated it. I've learned. I've been taking notes. I don't know if you could tell that, <laughs> but I'm um, so thankful that you were here today. And of course, everyone is welcome to join the one o'clock session to really dig deeper into how we can support our students um, in, this, in, in this mental health crisis. With gratitude, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.